hvala gospodinu Kučineli na ovom inspirativnom predavanju, a mi nastavljamo dalje. Prije ručka za govornicu nam još izlazi istaknuti arhitekt iz Danske, gospodin Louis Becker, ravnatelj i partner na kompenhaškom Henning Larsen arhitektcu. Bio je dio je menadžerskog tima, dakle od 1998. odgovoran za aktivnosti tvrtke na globalnom tržištu, jedan od pokretačkih sila i za mnogih velikih danskih i međunarodnih projekata. 2011. je nagrađen posebnim priznanjem za doprinos danskoj arhitekturi u svijetu. Njegovo predavanje nosi naslov Zgrade, javni prostor. Pa evo, pozdravite ga, molim vas, gospodin Louis Becker. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I just want to congratulate the former speaker. I think it was fantastic, marvelous projects we saw uh, recently. I don't understand Italian, and there was no transla translation, but I understood it anyhow, because it was very clear, uh, kind of shown on the, on the slides. Okay, I'm coming from a, an, a, a, an architectural firm, Henning Larsen Architects, a studio in Copenhagen. It's uh, more than 50 years old, uh, formed by, by Mr. Larsen, who recently died as an old man. Um, we are coming out of a very Scandinavian tradition, which means that we are rooted very much in the way we think in, 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 uh, in Northern Europe or in, in places where there's a scarce resource as daylight. And, uh, and also until recently have been a not very wealthy part of the world. We have grown into being an international uh, firm working with our competences in, in different countries and having offices in six different places uh, at the moment. We are more than 200 people and we are doing projects that typically goes from cultural projects, um, educational projects, headquarters, and master planning. We're also doing residential, but in a smaller scale. I'll show you one project as such. But it also means that we work in different cultures, in different climates. And when I'm going to talk about the relation between building and public realm, that kind of also have a huge impact on how you design the buildings to be kind of, um, let's say, meaningful in a, in a specific context. Working, working outside Scandinavia and working in, in competitions always, we're doing 80% of our work comes from competitions. Um, we, and we're doing quite a few large scale projects. We have kind of learned that there's some things that needs to be in place to be successful or be able to do the projects. And it maybe it's not a, a, a big surprise for any of you, but for us, we need to, let's say, formulate this uh, specifically, talking about how the relation is between, uh, between, let's say, the traditional architectural quality or the artistic quality in the architecture, the professional kind of way of executing it to be able to build it and hold these enormous budgets. We are uh, doing more than two projects of a scale more than a half a billion euros and then bring in the knowledge bring in the knowledge about sustainability uh, buildability acoustics stuff like that in the uh, in the projects and also means that we have changed the the uh, let's say the the uh, configuration of people in the office also to include engineers which we never had before we have 16 engineers working full-time with sustainability to be able to develop that in a meaningful way. We have a common design method, not a surprise for any of you, but when you're a large-scale firm, it's important to be able to talk about, let's say, a specific time in the project and everybody knows what that is. Most important is the strategic concept. And I think many architects, many colleagues, including myself for a long time, didn't really work so much with the strategic concept. The strategic concept for us is that, let's say, what, what is the purpose of this project? What are we supposed to, to do when we, when we take away all these uh, you know, 
pages and pages and pages in the binders that talks about all the things you need to do. It's typically three, five things you need to 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 be successful about or or to solve, and the rest is kind of add-ons. But to 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 come into that, you need to have a process where you where you digest you digest the all the information, make a kind of analytic exercise, and out of that you do a strategic concept. And that is not the architectural concept. This is about what the project should do and not about how it looks or the spaces, how they should be. But cutting away all that kind of uh, uh, method, of course we're doing projects for people and this is super important to remember that all the time. The main focus of our production is to create spaces for people to interact in, either as social spaces, learning spaces, urban spaces, so forth. These spaces or this kind of aim to work for people, we use two tools very much in, in, in the office, and that's the spatial configuration, and that's the daylight. And daylight, which also is a major focal point in our, in our sustainable approach, is because that we are coming out of this Scandinavian uh, uh, context where daylight in the wintertime is, is not very much, and in the summertime you have it until 11, 12 o'clock at night, in Denmark, at least 11 o'clock. So, so, so the treatment of daylight in a in a Copenhagen kind of situation or in Saudi Arabia is something we really, really work a lot with. But also, let's say, let when we bring in these more uh, engineering skills in in the uh, in in the office, it's also because we want to be able to quantify it. We can see that daylight. Uh, configuration of, of spaces is the single most important factor for doing energy savings in buildings. And we, at least, uh, the former speaker talked about 36% uh, um, coming from the architectural exercise uh, to, to the energy saving. I must say our research shows that, and we've done 24 projects we have tested, it's 50% of the energy saving that comes from the architectural kind of configuration of spaces and the design. So it's, it's really a lot. And it means that the, the um, responsibility for sustainability is not with the engineers or with the client. It's very much with the architect. This is just an example of how we convince our clients to, to work with, with, this with this approach in the project to understand it. This is a, a typical, this is a 30 by 30 meter uh, grid. This could be an office building in, in the US. And what we're showing them, and if we have a 2.7 meter floor to ceiling height, this part, the green part, cannot be used for permanent workspace because there's not sufficient daylight. And we, at least in Scandinavia, we need 2% of the daylight uh, in total in this area if you have a permanent workspace. If you go to, to, uh, to 3 point uh, something meters, 3.7 meters, you have the full space available, which means that it's a much more flexible building. It's a building that will be able to s last as a structure for mo many, many more years, uh, even with new rules being applied. So there's a there's a there's a, a, a direct kind of relation between the architectural ambition and the viability of the project, also the financial one. I'll take you through some projects. Uh, that all will have a relation or a kind of a very precise relation to, to indoor-outdoor space. This is the opera in Copenhagen. We completed that, um, I think, nine years ago now in, in, in Copenhagen. It's a, it's a 41,000 uh, square meter um, building. It's, it's a private donation from a, 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 a very wealthy person to, to Denmark. And for us, it was a very important project because it was not just an opera, it was also a cultural venue that should kind of give a new meaning to a new part of, or an, an old part of Copenhagen that were kind of um, reinvented, so to speak. It was a former naval base. Situated across the um, Royal Palace, we have the big harbor space going through here, the water. The opera is, is kind of a, a very dominant, a very visible thing when you when you pass the um, the bridges connecting uh, the different parts of the city. The opera itself 
is a big machine, basically. It's a machine that have uh, five stages that can move about. And then you have a Fourier space, and, a, if, and you can see how small space the audience really sit in the auditorium. It's a uh, horseshoe shape like, like this theater, which is nice to see. Uh, we chose that for, for it because we wanted an, a traditional opera, an opera where you see the face of the singer. If you have these very big ones, the shoe-box-shaped shape, shoe, uh, box shaped, uh, auditoriums, you cannot see the singers because it's too far away, and you need to have a, a screen behind, the, um, behind the, the, the seat of the next row. In this one, you ca everybody can see what's happening. But most important here is actually the, the foyer space and the, the, uh, the forecourt or the, the plaza in front. We created this, uh, this big 34-meter uh, cantilevering roof to create a, a kind of an indoor-outdoor place that should be the formal entrance to the, uh, to the opera, but also the, the space you see across the water when you uh, approach the area. And this is maybe the most important picture of, uh, of the opera at all, because it, it talks about how there's a relation between the people that are inside um, having, let's say, dressed for the festive in, in a nice evening, communicate with the city on the outside. We think it's very important that people that don't pay 100 euros to get in there for one night, they also share or get a piece of, of a part of that uh, thing um, or action happening on the outside. Inside, it's very much a, a vivid, very uh, lively place with, with, uh, with a lot of people. You see the bridges connecting to the auditorium here. The auditorium is made as a, as a, as a, as a wooden uh, uh, nutshell um, taking the colors and the varnish from music instruments. And the bridges here, they are not on top of each other because we want to have a situation where people meet in this area. And it means that by having the bridges on a, uh, on a, on a different uh, position, you can see the people on the next bridge and they can see you, which is, is quite important. We, we work with Olaf Eliasson, uh, which is an Icelandic Danish artist, to create all these, these all this almost magic uh, kind of atmosphere with the with the big uh, lighting fixtures, and I'm showing this also because later on the last project is also a collaboration with this artist. Inside, it's almost like seeing this theater we're seeing here. It's a little bit bigger. Uh, we have a 1,450 seats inside. Um, we we very much try to to celebrate the donator who's a keen sales sportsman. So we, we worked a lot with wood, varnished wood, which is also his kind of preferred material as a, as a uh, private person. We have uh, uh, rehearsal rooms underwater or under uh, in the basement, which is five stories underground, which is basically underwater. Um, and again, work with wood with, with uh, technical panels behind here. And it means that this ensemble can make the acoustics for any music venue in the world uh, by, by, uh, by working with these uh, panels. And that means they can rehearse for the uh, uh, Berlin Philharmonica, they can work with the New York places, in even in Copenhagen. Very much connected to the city, the historical part of, of the city as such. And then at, at night time, you see how the, the big roof creates this this space on the outside and from a, from a distance. It's a quite a big building in, in Copenhagen and, and right now we are looking to build next to it uh, on both sides so it would be kind of part of a, a city block. The next project is from Hamburg. It is the Der Spiegel. Um, I don't know if you know the magazine. It's a very academic uh, magazine. It's like in, well, maybe even more than Newsweek. Um, it is um, it's it's a magazine that that I have a, a very critical kind of eye on society and and for us it was very important in this competition to open up the the building and have a kind of dialogue between the editorial processes and the um, and the city of, of of Hamburg. It's placed in the in the Hafen city, very big new development uh, in the almost inner part of of, of the city. It's a former let's say very much harbor industrial area and 80, 
80 to 90 percent of the buildings have been kind of rebuilt or new buildings coming in. And we have the Elb Philharmonie made by Herzog and Demerong. They are still waiting to open that. Uh, and we have the, the Der Spiegel uh, magazine building on the other end. We, in the competition, had a lot of fun to talk about that this is for the emotions and this is for the more strict, strict academic kind of thinking in the same place. We wanted to open up and, and get in a dialogue with the, with the city, as I said before, but it also means that we are taking into consideration the new, the new park areas, the, the big streets coming down here, um, the, uh, the face to the Hauptbahnhof of the, uh, of the city. Der Spiegel have this f red frame uh, in all the, the front pages. Uh, we took that as a, as a starting point, maybe li a, bit, a little bit cheesy, um, put it on, uh, on, on these very airy white buildings on a brick base, and the brick base refers to the, to the warehouses of the historical warehouses in the area, and then created this uh, open square. It's 50,000 square meters in total, and in the competition we were the only project that divided this into two pieces as such. So we did, we did, a, we did a, a, a Spiegel part on Erkospitze, which is the area, but this we call this the Erkospitze, and then this plaza in front. We wanted to create an invitation. We, we, s we said in the competition, but also to the client afterwards, there's some obligations when you build in a city. You cannot do as you would do it on a countryside or in a greenfield area or industrial area. You have to make this invitation. You have to understand that you are a, a responsible partner with the city, which means that you provide on your land some, let's say, open area, some plaza for the public. We put the, the restaurants. We have uh, some uh, bookshops here, and this is the entrance to the Der Spiegel building. On the outside, it means that now we have, we have, uh, we have the, the cafes. Um, unfortunately, the staff wanted to eat alone, so they put this water pool in front. Uh, and at the moment, this is only the staff going outside, and hopefully we get them to, to change their mind. But also means that, that you have the, the big base coming up here with the, with the kind of airy building uh, on top. Inside, it's a 14-story high atrium connecting the floors, and we have all these, uh, all these bridges. And in some ways, you don't really need the bridges, but again, as a simple kind of gesture, to the staff, we wanted to show that you can. Y there's a transparency. You can kind of walk to your colleagues, and and work together instead of having, as they had before, traditional offices with uh, with doors. We have big um, big open uh, uh, areas, which is breakout areas. This is the uh, area with the, with the Werner Penton. Interior Werner Panton, quite famous Danish architect, at least in Denmark, and uh, they used to have a Werner Panton building, or totally fit out with Werner Panton, and we took this part with us, or some of the lamps and stuff, and made this area here. And the bridges looks quite chaotic, but when you look, when you walk there, it, it, it's uh, it's quite open, as such. And from the outside, it's a gesture that opens that that the building opens up with this big kind of window. To the um, uh, to the Hauptbahnhof and the city center, and here in this in this kind of frame inside, we also have the Spiegel television, and uh, hopefully, and they're not doing it yet. We will have a studio where people can see a live uh, uh, transmission from uh, the Spiegel. Completely different uh, project, and um, but a, a for us very important project in Copenhagen. It's a university building. It's a low-cost building. Uh, we had a very limited budget. Uh, we had, um, I wouldn't say, s such not so ambitious program because the budget was low. Uh, and we basically took the money, also sustainability-wise, and used them in one area, all of it. And then the rest was kind of the cheapest, low standard we could, we could buy for the money. This is the outside, and I have to say that the facade is part of the low-budget thing, but the inside is where we put the money. It's basically two, uh, two volumes that creating a kind of a, uh, a, a inner courtyard uh, between them, 
we have this is the ground floor where we have the big auditoriums and the restaurants and the bars. Um, all the money they are spent in this area here, and they are spent here because it's all about creating a institution that invites the students to study, to share knowledge, but also invites the public to go through. This is a public access. You can walk through. There's no uh, swipe cards or no guards or anything. Everybody can walk through here. It means that it becomes part of the city. And this is thing is about how you, let's say, integrate the public realm into a, into a building. Inside, we are working with these, uh, we work with these uh, cantilevered boxes, which is the meeting areas or meeting uh, rooms for the students, group rooms, which also have a, a very transparent kind of opening uh, on, on in this direction. And it means that you can be on these bridges and see what happens basically everywhere in the building. On the outskirts of this, we have the classrooms. And the classrooms are very traditional to 28 students, no fun at all. In here, it's where you activate knowledge. We have a philosophy when we do these educational buildings because we've done so many of them and used a lot of, lot of, uh, a lot of many, many, many hours to, to understand what is the processes here. And you can say when I talk about strategic concept, this is exactly uh, what, we what we do. But if, if you take knowledge as such in a, in a university, you have like a three-step philosophy. First, uh, f first is that you, you receive the knowledge in a lecture or could be also in a classroom. You discuss the knowledge. You kind of try to find out what, what was it all about. And then in the end, you can activate it and to do that, you need to create spaces and architect for that. Otherwise, it will not happen. Many universities in, in many countries have this thing about that you go for a lecture and you go home alone. That doesn't work. You have to work with your fellow students. And our surveys in this field shows that something between 40 to 60% of the knowledge you can activate comes from this kind of discussions you have with your fellow students. So the lecture in itself is only a minor part of it, but it, it kind of kickstarts a discussion that later on becomes to activated knowledge. You see the, um, the, 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 the boxes here and, and, and how they're, they're constructed. Even though we, we had to, for save, to save a little money, we have to use these, uh, these steel rods to, to carry to for the load bearing of it. Sustainable-wise, we work with uh, photovoltaics on, on, these, um, on these beams. Uh, and but, but I have to say, this is, this is almost 10 years ago. And at that time, the, the, um, the efficiency of the photovoltaics was so low that it was more gadget than, than a real asset to the, to the building. Another project which is completely different again, which is residential, and I'm showing this because it also talks about the public realm, but in a residential situation. It's called The Waves. It's in a provincial city of, of Denmark. It's a um, it's an high-end um, apartment block uh, area, which is, of course, you can see directly to the, to the sea, to the fjord. Um, it's the east is here, west is here, which means all the apartments go all the way through. So you have full daylight in the, in the apartments, no matter if it's morning or, or evening. It has this um, kind of lush um, atmosphere. And, and the, the concept was only to, was very simple, was to kind of, um, let's say, show the the, the characteristics of the city, and at the same time, just use the daylight as the as the design factor. So it's a very white, it's a very transparent building, and it's 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 formed very much by with the daylight. And then we have the the balconies to the north. This is ceramic tiles uh, facing uh, facing south, and there's some opening, so you get daylight in it at at midday. But but in these apartments, nobody can afford to stay at home; they have to work uh, midday at least to be there. We were only building two of them, then the contractor went bankrupt. That was in 2000 and, oh, that's early. That's even in 2004, I think. And now we are, we are we're completing the last three, so we get five of them in total. 
Another major project we're doing at the moment uh, in Munich, and that's why we have an office in Munich, um, is the uh, Siemens Global Headquarter. It was a competition, and um, we were qualified through a long, long, long process. Uh, and in the end, there was like 14 offices competing for, for the for the um, for the job. And um, most of our colleagues worked a lot with the, let's say, the grandeur of Siemens. Siemens, of course, is one of the biggest companies in the world. And um, I think they also feel like that. Um, but, but to do that, to, to build a headquarter in a city center uh, with this kind of muscular approach, in our opinion, didn't work. So... Um, when we when we was when when I worked with the we, we, with the team, we very early strategically said Siemens is kind of visiting Munich, and they have to kind of let's say understand that and be part of the city, and they cannot do a very corporate big headquarters that will not work at all. So what we did was we took the opposite approach and said how do we do a very nice Munich city block that have m Siemens as the major kind of um, kind of tenant as such and how do we invite the Munich people to to uh, to see this place somehow this is Wittelsbacher Platz we have Marienplatz down here uh, Hofgarten is just over in this area and we have the museums viertel in 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 this area here and what we did here was creating a a a kind of public path through the headquarter. A path from Marienplatz all the way up to the museums in this area. And that meant that the whole tradition of a, our normal understanding of a headquarter with all these security boundaries and barriers cannot be used. It's a different way of thinking it. Um, we also took into the design the, uh, the Hofer the courtyard strategy of of uh, of the city, and uh, and basically we we used that to transform from the the whole concept from being this one block headquarter to a series of courtyards with openings and invitations to get to get in. So this is the Wittelsbacher Platz uh, with the uh, with the statue of the uh, I think Leopold, uh, former king, uh, and then. We opened up this corner between, this is also a Siemens building and this is the Siemens Palais, that the two buildings opened up and you walk right into this, uh, to this area. You walk into a, to a, to a world of, of courtyards that have different kind of, of atmospheres, but also have a kind of a different destinations 